Josie, thank you so much for joining us today and being willing to be our first person. And in two weeks, we'll have Freddie as our yes. first person as we close out our program. We have, as you know, a short time, so we'll, we'll start right away. Your parents, Fanny and Jacques Eisenberg, were married in early 1938, and you were born in March 1939, just months before Germany and Russia invaded Poland to start World War II. Before we turn to the war and the Holocaust, tell us about your parents, your family, what their life was like before the war began. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, my parents, please excuse my throat. Um, my parents were really newlyweds. They both had professions. They, they, I think, entered marriage and wanted to have a good life. Um, there was, in Belgium, the Jews assimilated quite well. And um, their relationship with their neighbors and with everyone and with their family seemed to be very, very good. And of course, it wasn't sure. They, they really didn't know of the impending doom that would happen very, very soon. My mother was um, a dressmaker. She had gone to a special textile vocational school. And um, apparently when they graduated, the royal family in Belgium would come and pick out a few students to work at the royal household. So my mother was actually working for the royal household. Um, which was a huge honor. Which it was, was, it was honor. a big deal. Yeah. My, mom, my mom was thrilled. She really was. I mean, she was a young person and just, you know, working for the royal family was really something very special. My dad uh, was a tailor and um, we had a shop. We, we lived in a, a four-story apartment building. We lived on the bottom floor and part of the, the bottom floor, there was a store, a tailoring store, which my dad ran. And in those days, you couldn't just go and buy a suit ready-made. You would, my father had lots of bolts of material. So a person would come in, choose the material they wanted for a suit. And then my dad would make a pattern and measure him and fit him. And, you know, making a suit for someone wasn't just a short deal. It take, took weeks and weeks. The customer would keep on coming back and being measured and fitted. So my dad was a tailor and my mom was in the dressmaking business. Being a tailor, though, was not your father's first occupation. No. Uh, you know I'm going to ask you yes. to tell us that. Yeah. Yes. Um, my dad, believe it or not, in the 20s and 30s, um, the movies, they had silent movies. They were not talkies. So because of that, in Europe, or in Belgium anyhow, different movie houses hired quartets, violin, cello, um, viola, for people to play while the film was showing. So my dad was a violin player, and uh, when the talkies came uh, in the late 30s, my dad lost his job. So in fact, all the musicians lost their jobs. So my dad went to tailoring school, became a tailor, and so that was really his second profession. I, I just love having you tell us that. Your, your parents were married in 1938. Nazi power in Germany and Austria took an even more ominous turn mm -hmm. also in 1938 with Kristallnacht or the Night of Broken Glass in late November. You were born March uh, 1939, mm -hmm. just months before Germany yes. and Russia invaded Poland to begin the war. Given the political circumstances and the rise of Nazism, do you, do you, did you learn later, did you know if for your parents that having you in the midst of that environment, was that something that was very worrisome to, to you them? You know, I imagine it was. Of course, I don't recall them talking right. about it because I, I was so young. But <clears throat> I think they were very concerned. They were very worried. Um, they would listen to the radio continuously and um, mainly to the BBC mm -hmm. and to hear what was going on in the world. It was scary, and um, I, I think they were worried how far Germans would come in Europe, how far to the West, 
Um, so I think it was very worrisome. In, in late November, Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, yeah. when uh, all over Germany and, and Austria, uh, parts of Czechoslovakia, I, be, I believe there was a horrific night of violence and vandalism against Jews and against their businesses. Yes. Your parents, soon after that, I think they took in a child uh, for yes. a period of time. Tell us what you know about that. As far as I know, my mom, <coughs> my, my parents, actually my dad had already left. Um, my mom took in a Jewish child that had been caught where Kristallnacht, where the Germans were. So my parents, my grandparents actually, and my mother mm -hmm. took in this little girl to stay with us um, till she found a safer place with some family. Um, it was very worrisome for Jews. Jews were running, trying to get away from where the Germans had already invaded. So it was very, very worrisome and very scary. And of course, a year or so later, in May 1940, eight months after Germany attacked Poland, they invaded what we call the Low Countries, yeah. Belgium, the Netherlands, and France. Your father left to join the British Army just mm -hmm. before the Germans launched their invasion. Tell us what your father did and then what that meant for your mother and for you. Sure. My, um, as I mentioned, my parents would listen to the radio all the time, and they heard calls from Britain asking people to volunteer to join the British Army. Um, my dad, actually, and his brother both decided that they would volunteer and try and get to Britain to join the British Army. Both of them were tailors. My uncle, my dad's brother, was also a tailor, and they both decided to actually go to England. And they left Belgium. Um, my dad left when I was 13 months old. And they got to England, which was very, very dangerous at the time, because the Germans were actually torpedoing boats um, crossing the channel. So my dad did get to England, and the British government or the army decided what could they do with these two guys. And they were both tailors. And what they did is they put them in a factory making British uniforms um, for the army, and which was the best place my dad could be. Right. So, but he did leave, and my mom and I, and my maternal grandparents, her, my mom's parents, we all stayed together. In, in light of a current, <coughs> a current film, Dunkirk, I yes. was thinking about you as this film came out because your father left from Dunkirk, and I think he left on one of the last ships that got out before the Germans arrived. Yes, yeah. he did. And actually, he got to England, and my mom never knew whether he actually got there or not because there was no communication at all. War had already started. So once he left, that, that was, was it. That was it. Yeah. So. What, what did your, to your knowledge, what did your mother do now? You're 13 months old, it's just the two of you, plus your, gran your yes. grandparents. Yes. Well, you know, things were very limited as far as food was concerned, care. Uh, my mother always used to tell me that in Belgium and in many other countries in Europe, they have... Um, special places where you take newborns and you get care, uh, immunizations, and all kinds of care from the doctors. And once the war started, that really stopped. So my mom, in a way, it's not that she was stuck with me, but she didn't really have any outside services that she could use. And she was with her parents, who were living with us, and we were pretty much to ourselves. Mm -hmm. At that time also the Germans, when they invaded, everybody had to carry an identity card and in it it actually stated if you were Jewish or not. And you had to carry that card wherever you went on the street and of course you could be stopped at any time by a German and say, you know, they would say, give me your identity card and um, you had to give it and they decided what they would do. So I think my, my mom and I and my grandparents were in a very precarious position. Mm -hmm. um, things were very limited and we kind of relied on ourselves. And, and you would remain in those circumstances um, under Nazi occupation yes. until 1942 
which is when your mother made the, the really profound decision to place you into hiding. Tell us what about the events that led up to your decision, your mother's decision yeah. to hide, have you hidden, but also during that period of time, two years really, that you were existing in the circumstances you described. What was your life like? What was life like for your mom during that time? Well, my mom actually, she was part of the underground. Part of the resistance? For part of the resistance. Mm -hmm. She would um, deliver leaflets for meetings at the underground where they were meeting somewhere. She would also take in Jews who would flee from countries where the Germans had already invaded. So we very often had people sleeping at our house till they would go to another safe place. Mm -hmm. um, so because my mother was part of the underground, she kind of had, um, there was a whole network and she was able to get um, someone to pick me up, two women to come, <coughs> excuse me, to pick me up and put me into hiding. Now, to me, that's probably one of the hardest decisions I think that she could have made. Uh, when they put a child in hiding, they, were, they weren't able to tell the parents where they were being placed because they knew when the Germans would come and to your apartment to see who was there or to try to arrest you, they would say, where's the rest of your family? Where are your children? Where's your husband? And they would torture you till they got it out of you. And so they decided the underground, when they would take children and put them in hiding, they would not tell the parents where they were being placed. So your mother doesn't know anything about her husband, no. your father. Now you're gone. She knows nothing about you. Before we come back to your time in hiding, a couple of other things I want to ask you about. You mentioned having to carry ID cards with yes. s that said Jew on it. Yes. Um, you have, although you were very young, you shared with me a, a fleeting memory you have about being on a bus with your mother before you went into hiding. Yeah. Um, we, did, we kept very much to ourselves, but once in a while I did have an outing with my mom and on one such a day, um, we went, we took a bus ride to go, I, I can't remember even where we went, but my mom and I got on the bus. Um, we didn't have, in bus, we didn't have buses in Belgium. We used trams, mm -hmm. which were electrically. Um, Electrical trolleys. Trams. Trolleys. Um, so my mom and I got on the bus and we sat the last row on the bus all the way at the end. And while we were dry, riding on this, on this tram, um, a German officer came on the, tr on the tram and asked everybody for their ID cards. And he went row by row by row. <coughs> My mother was shaking. Uh, I didn't understand why, but uh, this German officer went from row to row and he got to the last row and he turned around and he never asked us for our ID which somebody was looking over mm -hmm. on us because that was a pretty close call. My mother stopped shaking and of course I never knew, I never connected it. I didn't realize that she was so afraid of, the, uh, of what might happen, but I was saved then. And, and one of the things that might have happened, uh, certainly beginning in 1942, were deportations exactly. to Auschwitz. That's when Belgium Jews were actually started being deported in 42. Your grandparents and your great-grandparents, um, tell us what happened to them during that time. Well, actually, f first I must say I was placed, I was put in hiding, and two, two ladies came to pick me up, two strange ladies who I didn't know, and as I mentioned before, my mother was not allowed to know where I was going. And um, they came to pick me up and they took me to a beautiful little city in Belgium called Bruges and it's full of convents. And they took me to this convent. My mother, of course, as I mentioned, didn't know where I was going. 
Um, and uh, they took me to this convent and full of nuns. Um, nuns, not as you see today, dressed in modern clothing, but very much like the nuns in The Sound of Music. Um, very stiff gear, very, um, very stiff. <laughs> the nuns were also very strict, but um, they, they placed me in hiding, which was wonderful. It was more, it was a convent, but it was more like an orphanage. People, because there was no food, very little food, and it was during war, so people would put their kids in a convent, like an orphanage, and hope that they would pick them up when things got easier for them. So that's where I actually that's was. That's where you were. That's where I was. However, in the meantime, mm -hmm. I think I was placed really just in time, because Soon after that, my mom and her parents were deported. They were actually arrested, deported, and taken to Auschwitz. And in your mother's case, it was she was denounced by somebody. Yeah. Somebody told on her, informed. One of our neighbors. One of your neighbors. You know, there were many wonderful people in Belgium. I mean, people helped me. I'm here today because of them. But there were also many people who got money from the Germans if they would tell them where the Jews were. So my actually our neighbor um, is the one who denounced my mom and, and her parents. So they were taken to Auschwitz. And, and of course, we're gonna talk more about your mother later. Your, your, your grandparents perished at Auschwitz. Yes, they did. My, my grandfather died on one of the trains. Mm -hmm. um, getting to Auschwitz, and my grandmother and mother were separated as soon as they got to Auschwitz. You know, there were selections. Um, most concentration camps, when you got there, they were killing centers. You got there and they killed you. Auschwitz had a sub-camp, a labor camp, where they made ammunition. And Germany was very interested in gearing up, you know, their ammunition production for the war. So in Auschwitz, they had a factory, Birkenau, which was actually a labor camp. And as soon as you got off the train, there was what they call a selection. The older folks or handicapped or children would be put in one line. And the stronger people, the younger people, like my mom, who was in her early 20s, would be put on another line. So there was a selection, and immediately my mom and her mother were separated. And um, my mother wanted to be with her mother, so she went into the line where her mother was, and the German actually hit her and told her that you go where you're told to go. And she actually never saw her mother again. So my grandparents perished very, very soon. Well, my grandfather died right on the train, and my grandmother, right after. as soon as she got there. So you're m with your mother at Auschwitz, you're in this convent, and you would, you would be in the convent for about a year. Tell us about what you can about your time in that convent, and then what led to the decision to then move you to live with a Christian family. So yes. In the convent, as you said, the nuns looked like Sound of Music, but they were very, very strict. And they didn't sing. And they didn't <laughs> sing, they were very strict. But, well, but well, to, to the extent you know, what was your life like in that convent? There was, um, I, I can't compare it to other convents. I don't think I've been in another one, but this had a very large courtyard, um, kind of inside the convent. It was out in the open, and the children would really, we would all play together, and we would say our rosaries many times a day. Uh, I, I would say my rosaries in French. I didn't know what I was saying, but I would say my rosaries. And we would play. And by the way, I was in the convent for, I believe, um, a little bit more than six months. A little bit more than six months. And unbeknownst to me, there were three other Jewish children there being hidden. The convent was full of kids, but there were four Jewish kids there being hidden. And you know, in Belgium, probably most countries in Europe, if you were hiding a Jew, you were really risking your life because if the Germans found you, 
they would just shoot you on the street. No questions asked. They would just shoot you. So these nuns, however strict they were with me, and they saved my life. And um, the reason I was moved out of the convent, before apparently. You, before you tell yes. us that, while you were in the convent, I think, you, 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 your name was changed. Yes. And tell us what name they, you were given, and there's some significance about that name, right? Well, the name, my first name remained the same because it was a French name, but my last name, uh, which was, I guess, a Jewish name, um, they changed my last name on my documents to more of a Flemish Dutch name, which was Van Berg. And uh, I, I had that name. And, and Flemish, and it was, you were in an area that was more Flemish? Yes, yeah, so, near the Dutch border. So it was, you could, in a, yes. high easier is the, is the notion yes. behind that. Um, so you, as you said, you were moved to the Dubracalaires. You were about to tell us that. What led to the decision to move you to, to their home? Um, apparently the nuns found out that the Germans were going to come, the Nazis were going to come and pick up the four Jewish children. And the nuns... So again, somebody had probably informed? Yes. Um, and I've heard this happen quite a few times in Belgium. The nuns would, be, would find out that the Germans were going to come and pick up Jewish children. And they would always tell the Germans, the kids aren't ready yet, let us get their clothes ready and come back tomorrow morning. And that's what they did. They would come back, but in the meantime, the nuns actually smuggled the four of us out of the convent and brought us all to Brussels, which is where I was originally from. Mm -hmm. And they placed me with a Catholic family, um, a mother, a father, and a little girl. And I stayed with them really for the rest the duration of the war. Until September of 1944 yes, when... when Belgium was liberated. When it was liberated. Yeah. So we, the man, by the way, was part of the underground also. Mr. Du Bracolaire. Mr. Du Bracolaire. He would, they would very often take him out and interrogate him at night, the Nazis, and he would come back black and blue. Um, he did all kinds of things in the underground, I guess, to upset whatever the Germans were doing. And, uh, but he never told on me. And um, I stayed with them, as I said, really, for the rest of the duration of the war. Do you know um, how they explained your presence in their home? Um, I hardly went out. Mm -hmm. So there was really no, I don't think there was much explaining. Um, I didn't go out very much. I didn't see people. Um, you know, in Belgium, food was rationed, and you would pick up your ration once a week at a special center to however many people were registered. And they were registered for three people, the mother, the father, and the little girl. I was there illegally. So they would pick up the food once a week, but shared with me. So in a way, they really, they really did risk their lives in every way. Mm -hmm. And... Um, we very much kept to ourselves, and I really didn't see very many other people. Pretty much stayed indoors yes. during that whole time. Tell us what, what that was, as best you know, what would that was like for you to be not only in their household with their family, but really restricted in terms of not being able to go out. So you're there all the time. What do you recall of what that was like for you? A little girl, Josie Ann, what yeah. was that like for you? <coughs> Well, what I remember, I used to play with a little girl all the time. Their daughter? With the daughter. But what I do remember, they were a very close unit. They were, they were a family. And uh, however wonderful they were with me, I wasn't part of the unit. Um, and I guess I felt that as a little girl. I don't think they meant to make me feel that way. But... Uh, I didn't feel part of that family unit. One of the, Jos Josie, one of the things that you shared with me was that they, they obviously risked their life to yeah. protect you, they took care of you, they fed you, but as you said, th they didn't hug you, they didn't, you know, kiss you to sleep, right. uh, and, and as a little girl, you felt that. 
much. I did. Yeah, I know you've been very eloquent. Uh, uh, and I feel very fortunate that, you know, I feel very strongly psychologically that the first three years of life, if you bond with someone, um, a caregiver that is important to you, it really establishes a certain well-being that carries you throughout life. And I felt I had that from the first three years of my life with my grandma mm. and my mother. my mother. So although I missed it later on, I think I still had those memories, how that was. Mm. So that solid grounding yeah. in the family. Belgium was liberated in, in 1944, in the fall of 1944, when the war ended for Belgium, the war still going yeah. on elsewhere in Europe. Your Aunt Therese was able to find you and she brought you to her home. How did that happen? You know, for example, no one knew where you were because right. of what you explained. So how, how did your aunt find you and what was it like for them to take you from the Dubrock Allaires sure. to their home? Um, my mom had two sisters and my two aunts, and they were also hidden through the underground in churches. Um, so really, Belgium did a lot as far as saving many of their Jews. Um, because my aunt, my, my mom, the older aunt, um, had three sons, my three cousins, and they were all hidden in a church. But because they were part of the underground, there was a network and they really, they found me. They found me at the Debracalaires and they came to pick me up. So, which was absolutely wonderful. They took me to their home and, um, and I was with them. And my three cousins who were just a few years older than me, they're three brothers, um, they spoiled me rotten. It was great. Mm -hmm. uh, they treated me like their mascot. And um, it was just wonderful being with family again. It really was. I felt the difference. You, you had been in a Catholic convent or an orphanage. You were with a Christian family, and now you're back with a Jewish family. Yeah. Was there any um, change for you in terms of awareness of, of being Jewish that you hadn't had up until that point? Well, I'm sh there was. My aunt would light candles Friday night, and we had you know, Sabbath dinner. They had many of the traditions mm -hmm. that, uh, although I don't remember them very much at home because I left so young. But we did have some of that with my, with my aunt. And it was, just, it was just wonderful being with family. Mm -hmm. It just... And getting that love and affection yeah. that you had missed. Tell us, if you don't mind, you told me a story about your uncle uh, who had, after the war, was recognized and it yes. was a big surprise. Tell, tell us this. Yes. My, my aunt's husband, my uncle Morris, um, he was a very shy, meek man. And um, after the war, he was actually decorated and honored for having been brave and killed many Nazi soldiers. It was unbelievable <laughs> because this was such a quiet, shy, meek man. I think no one in the family could believe it. Mm. So, but he was awarded and he was decorated, which is really something. And, and of course, during the immediate aftermath of the war in Belgium, and again, this is you know late summer, fall of 1944, uh, the, the Battle of the Bulge would happen. Yes. Um, Belgian is, you know, pretty much shattered. What, what did your, what was it like for your aunts to begin to kind of re, uh, rebuild their lives and your, your part of that? Well, I think it was very hard. Mm -hmm. They had, um, in Belgium, they actually, part of their apartment also, on the ground floor, they had a store, mm -hmm. a leather goods store. So of course, as soon as the war ended, they moved back to their place, they opened the store, and life really changed for them. I can't say it was back to normal, but excuse me, but somehow things regained mm -hmm. much more normalcy. So it was really, I think it was hard for them. They worked hard, but at least they were all together. Right. In, in, in what must have seemed to everybody, uh, your, your, your 
mother's sisters, to everybody. Uh, it must have seemed like an incredible miracle. Your mother, Fanny, survived Auschwitz. She returned to Brussels after her liberation in April of 1945 and then was reunited with her sisters. You were, you were six. What, what do you recall of your mother sort of just reappearing uh, yeah. when, when probably she'd been, people thought she was dead? Yes. I think we all thought she was dead. When my mom was liberated, she was a pretty sick woman. She had typhus and meningitis. And um, she eventually made her way down with the Red Cross, actually brought her back down to Belgium. And, you know, my mom, the first place she went was her sister's apartment. And she knocked on the door, and there I was. So we were reunited, and many of the things that I recall from that, I think are things that my mom told me, mm -hmm. um, because many things I don't remember. I mean, I was six years old, and I really don't remember many of the things, but it was wonderful seeing her again. Soon after she came back and you were reunited, um, she would take you and move back into what had been her home yes. in June of 1945, knowing, and I, I know a lot about your, your mother's, uh, what happened to your mother. She, as you said, she'd been not only incredibly sick and disabled, but she'd been through a horrific ordeal. Yeah. Do you know what it was like for her to sort of, and of course she still has no idea about your father, how she managed to both take care of you and try to rebuild her life at that point? You know, it must have been so difficult I think she relied a lot on her two sisters, and I think the family became very, very close. Um, and my mom kind of relied on whatever services she could get. Mm -hmm. And um, it wasn't until a year later in 47 that my dad actually returned from England to Belgium. But it was hard for my mom to manage. And and when your father came back, I think it was in 1946, I think, yes. year after the war. Yes. Um, tell us about that, because you remember that. I do remember that. My, my dad couldn't come back right after the war uh, because the apartment he was living in London, you know, there was so much bombing in London during the Blitz and everything else. Um, the house he was living in was bombed and he spent two years in hospital. So he was injured pretty badly. Mm -hmm. So when he did come back, when eventually my mom and he would connect and write, and we knew that he was coming back. And I remember going to the port city of Belgium, it's called Ostend, where these ships come in. And um, my mom and I waiting there, and my dad coming down the stairs, I, of course, didn't know who he was, but my mom actually pointed to him and said, there's your father. And I had no idea who this man was. And, you know, it was hard because the three of us went through such very different experiences. My mom went through hell. My dad had a pretty hard time. And I was just, you know, a child in the middle. So it was, it was a, hard. It was hard. It was hard. Did you, did, were they both able to resume their work lives at that time? Um, they were. My dad eventually worked again in his shop. Mm -hmm. um, and we lived in the same apartment because it was my parents' apartment building. And so we tried to resume life as much as we could. However, my parents decided they really needed to leave Europe. And so they decided to apply for visas and papers to come to the United States. And we eventually did in 1949. We had to wait uh, for a number of years for the, the quotas, to, our names to come up. So that, that was it. You had to just simply wait we until the wait. numbers came up. Yes. So it would take four years yeah. after the war, right. three years after your father came back. And my, and my dad, and my mom and I came to the United States along with his brother and mm -hmm. his, his wife and two girls. So the two families really came to the United States together. 
so here they come to the United States, you're 10 years old. Yes. And now it's to begin a whole new life for, for each of you. What do you remember about that for yourself? What was it like at 10 years old to arrive here and become an American? <laughs> well, first of all, I spoke no English. Um, and they put me in first grade. I was never told to begin with, so it's, you know, when you measure the kids. Well, and tell us why you were put in first grade. Oh, because I knew no English. Because you knew, so put you in the first grade. First grade. You don't know English, you don't understand first grade. And the reason I was saying I was never very tall, because first grade, I didn't stand out that much. You could fit in the, I was in the desks for the six right. first graders. Right. Yeah. But... Um, it took me a few days, a few weeks to learn a few words of English, and then they put me in second grade. And so on, it went for a few weeks till I finally left elementary school with my grade. I was in so my every grade. few weeks you're put into a new grade, okay. Yeah, yeah exactly. The, you know, the thing is, you know, I, now I can't remember not speaking English because it comes so naturally. But at the beginning was very, it was really difficult. And your father spoke English because he'd been in England. He did, but his English was not that great. What about your mother's adjustment? My mom spoke no English. No English, yeah. So, and it's interesting because when I came back home, we spoke French, or my parents spoke Yiddish mm -hmm. uh, to each other. And they went to night school as soon as they came to the United States. They wanted so much to become American. So they, they attended night school, they, they learned English, they learned all the capitals, all the states, all the presidents. Yeah. And when I would come home, they wouldn't speak French to me. They would only speak English because they wanted so much to learn you English. You described it at one time as they were passionate, aggressive yeah. about becoming American. They were, yeah. absolutely. And they took the test, you know, they, I don't think they have that today where you really have to pass a test. His Does still do for citizenship, yep. They do. Yeah, I don't know if it's the same test, but <laughs> you still do. So um, yeah. you, soon after you arrived though, you had a, a, a bad incident. You were in New Jersey and you were beaten up by a, a gang. A bunch of kids. A bunch of kids. <laughs> a bunch of girls. And a bunch of girls beat you up. Yeah. Will you say a little bit about that? Um, Actually, I think it was the first week I was in school. I came, when I came out of school, when school at the end of the day was finished, there was a group of girls waiting for me and they actually beat me up. And I had no idea why. Mm -hmm. um, and my mother went to school the next day, which I thought was pretty brave of her, not speaking very much English. And she wanted to know what had happened, why did they be beat me up? And the principal said to her, well, the children thought that, that your daughter was German. I don't know what bearing that has to do with it. I don't think kids at that time really differentiated or knew the, what a German was. But I wasn't beaten up again, uh, so that's good. Mm. And um, That was good, yes, that was that good. Was good. So see, um, did your did your aunts remain? Um, did they remain in Belgium? They did not. My my aunt with this, her three boys uh, went to Israel um, and settled there, and um, with her three sons. And um, my my younger aunt came to the United States and lived in New York. Mm -hmm. About the same time, or a little bit later. A little bit later. She waited a few years and. Um, and got a job, was working, and we were pretty close. Do you know how many of your extended family perished during the Holocaust? Well, I would say my grandparents, they had brothers and sisters. Um, my father's, one of his brothers perished um, with the children. So there were quite a, quite a few quite people. Quite a few people. Yeah. I'm lucky I'm here. Yeah, absolutely. And then and later you would meet another Holocaust survivor. Tell us about meeting Freddie. Okay. 
Um, I went to Israel for a year to study. And um, I, in those days, in the 50s, it wasn't that long ago, but in those days you didn't travel by plane. Planes were very expensive, so you went by ship. I was in Israel for a year. I went with a group of students, and it was really a wonderful experience. And coming on the way home on the ship, um, I met this officer. He was a chief radio officer on an Israeli passenger liner, and he was obviously socializing with the passengers. <laughs> <laughs> Me being one of them. And, <laughs> And we were married a year later. On the ship. On the ship. Yeah. Well, the ship was in port. Okay. You know, we had the band, the food, everything was there. It was like mm -hmm. having a, a very special place. And we had all our guests, and it was, it was just wonderful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Josie, your mother, Fanny, uh, your husband, Freddie, and you are each Holocaust survivors and are part of our first person program. Your mother, Fanny, was with us to start this 2017 year first person in March at age 100. Um, we look forward to her return in March of yes. 2018 when she's 101. Um, I think our audience should know that, um, should know that, and that just how yes. extraordinary it is that each of you, each of you continue to speak in the pu publicly about yeah. what you experienced what is that like for you to do this? What's it like for you and for your, for your family to do this? Well, for me personally, I can say that I'm, I'm really, it makes me feel good that people are interested and want to know what happened. Um, the only way you can really avoid some of these things happening again is by knowing the history mm -hmm. and what did happen. I feel very good, especially going to schools. Um, I go to middle schools, to Catholic schools, to high schools, and it really does make me feel very good mm -hmm. to hear that people are interested. They want to know. Mm -hmm. They really do. We spoke at my son's middle school. And yeah. it was, uh, for those kids, it was a profound, profound experience. They were lovely. Yeah. <laughs> Josie, we have, we have time to turn to our audience for a few questions. You, should we do that? Sure. Okay. Um, we've got a hand going up already. We're going to have um, two mics um, coming, one down each aisle. We're going to ask you to wait till you have the mic in your hand so that we can all hear it. Um, try to make your question. We've got two questions, I think, right up front. Try to make your question as brief as you can. I'll do my best to repeat it just to make sure we hear it uh, correctly, and then Josie will respond to it. So I, I know two hands shot up down here, um, right, right here in the, in the third row, I believe. There we go. Did you ever reunite with either the nuns or the family that took care of you? The question is, did you ever reunite with either the nuns or the family that took care of you? Um, yeah. My, the family, the Dubrach that I ask, my husband and I were in Belgium in 1989, and we tried to find them, the family, and they had all died, including the little girl who was my age. Um, the nuns, I wrote to the Belgium government because I really feel it's important to get them recognized, uh, to acknowledge what they did, and the, the order is no longer in existence. And from what I understand, what I've been told by other um, churches, organizations, that when an order diminishes or people die, they very often join another order. So I have not been able to find the nuns. They're no longer, um, that particular order is no longer in existence. And do you think that maybe a reason they didn't get emotionally attached to you was for protection for you and for them? The, qu the, the follow-up question is, do you think the reason that they did not um, get attached to you uh, emotionally um, is, is, was f a protective thing? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. That I really don't know. You know, 
it wasn't just with me, it was with all the kids. They were rather strict and um, I don't know if that's the demeanor in general of nuns. I'm not really sure. Okay. I, I think, okay. yeah, and, and that family, and, and the Dubrocolaires too, and then we're The Dubrocolaires, yeah, also. Yeah, okay. Did we have a question here? Maybe not, okay. Do we have a, another question here? We have a hand up right here, back behind you, Jocelyn. Oh, um, I'm sorry. And then there's one back up behind you as well. Do you spill, still speak French or Yiddish? Do you spill, still speak French or Yiddish? Not Yiddish. I never spoke Yiddish. But I speak French and I speak Hebrew. And you and Freddie, what do you speak with each other? Excuse me? Well, you and Freddie, what do you speak with each other? Oh, English. 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 Yeah. 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 In fact, um, I might mention that Freddie um, was rescued through what's known as a kinder transport and ended up in England. Uh, so spent many years in England before uh, going on to Israel. Okay, I ha we had a hand back there. There we go. I was just wondering if there was repercussions for the nuns when they came to get the Jewish children and they weren't there. Oh, the question is when, when, the, when, when the nuns would you know, delay to be able to hide the children, were there repercussions for them? You know, that I never found out. But I know there are many stories and essays that I've read in books um, of nuns doing that. I mean, that's the ultimate risk, you know, telling the Germans, come back tomorrow, we're not ready with the kids yet. And I don't know if the Germans ever came back and didn't see the kids and whether the nuns were punished. Mm -hmm. I really don't know that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, if, if anybody's thinking about another question, I'm, I'm, I have one. Oh, there we go. Uh, um, so your mom was told on and your grandparents were told on by your neighbor. Um, did your mom and have trust issues after that? Like oh. what next door to her cost her, your, her parents' lives? Um, it, how did she deal with that? The question is, um, since your mother and your grandparents were denounced by a neighbor, um, after later, did, did your mother have trust issues around um, other people because of having had that happen to her? Well, um, you know, I really don't know that because we, we did leave Belgium. We left Europe. Right. And I think that in itself told a lot because my parents did not want to remain there and probably because there were trust issues. You know, what if it happened again? What if neighbors did something again? So although I've never spoken about that to my mom, but it's probably a very interesting issue. And I suppose you, you have no idea whatever happened to that neighbor either. No. No, no. No, I really do not. By the way, you know, my mom, as Bill mentioned, is 100, and she volunteers here every Sunday. She sits at the survivor desk and talks to whoever wants to listen to her. And it is well worth spending some time, I can tell you that. Um, do we have another question? We have one right here. Thank that, you. That was part of my question. I was like, oh, man, she's 100. I want to meet her. <laughs> I, mean, I can't wait till next year necessarily. Um, we're a, a Catholic youth group here, and I was just wondering, like, we're actually going to go help some nuns next week. And I was like, have you ever been invited by any other nuns? You said you had never been to another convent to, to compare what nuns are like, oh. I guess. So I was just like, huh. I'm interested also in, like, have you prayed the rosary since then? Oh. Or, or did you ever learn anything about Catholics versus Jewish? And also, um, do you speak to youth groups other than just schools? Do you, I, I couldn't... Would she speak to youth groups or just oh, schools? Oh, question is, do you, do you speak to youth groups? Uh, have you been invited to uh, go to another convent and, 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 and speak at a convent uh, to see a difference... Uh, arrangement? Well, not to, I haven't been to a convent, but I've been to quite a few Catholic schools. Mm -hmm. um, I've been in Maryland, in Virginia, I've really been to many of them, and they're very, very interested in the history, and I'm always surprised how much they do know. Um, very impressive, and they read really a lot of books on, on the subject. Before, when I talk to kids in, in, in a school, 
um, I usually ask them, what have you read? What do you know? So that I know from what angle mm -hmm. to begin. And I'm always surprised that they've read so much of the literature, which is written for children, um, about the Holocaust. Very impressive what the teachers do with them, mm -hmm. really. We, we have time for one more question, and then uh, we're going we're gonna to wrap up um, with, uh, with, with Josie concluding our program. So stay, stay with us for a couple of minutes. Got one more here, and then um, I, for those of you who have just uh, raised your hands, Josie's going to remain on the stage after she finishes so we invite you to come up here and ask her her question. And she'll stay as long as you got a question to ask her. So please do come up here and do that. We have one question here. Hi, uh, I wonder if uh, how your mom um, handled the situation after the concentration camp. Did she, uh, was she angry? Did you, f did you forgive? Or how, when did she feel peace or? Yeah. Que the question, if I'm hearing it correctly, is, is how your mother, after going through what she went through, how did she handle it afterwards? Did she uh, f find peace at some point with what she went through? I think that's the question, uh, or, or a sense of forgiveness. What, did, what was your mother's re response over the years? And, and I would just before you answer, you shared with me that as a child you remember her having horrible nightmares. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's been extremely difficult for my mom. Um, I don't think she's ever really been able to um, totally understand and forgive what has happened. They also did, while she was in Auschwitz, they did medical experiments on her. So this is something also that she's lived through and um, I think it's, it's haunted her, really, her whole life. Um, mm -hmm. It's been very, very difficult for her. It really has. We're going to close our program in just a moment. Stay with us for just a, a couple of moments more um, because we're going to hear uh, again for, from Josie to close our program. I want to thank all of you for being with us. We have four more programs, Wednesday and Thursday of next week and the following week. And then we'll resume again in March of 2018. The museum's website um, pro will provide information about our 2018 program. So we hope that you might have the opportunity to come back and join us at another time. I'd also like to mention that our programs are now available through the museum's website uh, through a YouTube cha channel. So you'll be able to see Josie's program as well as, as others on the museum's website. Um, it's our tradition at first person that our first person has the last word. And so Josie is going to give us her last word. When she's done, Lolita, our photographer, is going to come up on stage, take a picture of Josie with you as the background. So stay with us, if you would. It makes for a terrific photograph. Um, and then, as I mentioned a moment ago, Josie will remain here on the stage. We invite any of you who want to to come up and ask another question or just say hi or have your picture taken or whatever you would like to do. All right, okay. Josie. Um, as Bill mentioned at the end of the program, the survivor or the person who's the first person always has the last word. I always read the same quote because to me it's one of the most important things in this museum. Um, I don't know if any of you have gone through the museum yet, but if you haven't, when you get to the second floor, at the end, as you leave the second floor exhibit, there's a saying on the wall, and it's written by Lutheran minister, Martin Neimuller. And to me, it is so significant that I always read it at the end because it's so meaningful. And let me read it to you. By the way, Martin Neimuller was very, very pro-Hitler at the beginning of the war because he, you know, Hitler promised so many wonderful things. And then when he did see what Hitler was doing, he was very much against him and he actually was imprisoned. Um, Martin Neimuller did not, not die in prison. He died in the, in the 80s, but this is what he wrote. First they came for the socialists. I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. 
Then they came for the trade unionist. I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews. I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. To me, this is what, in a way, this museum is about. When you see injustice, you see people inflicting pain on other people, you've got to say something. You can really, one person can make a big difference. That's why I'm here. People took a chance, and they spoke out, and they, they helped. Thank you.